In the early morning hours of June 8, 1998, General Sani Abacha, Nigeria's military dictator, died in a presidential villa in Abuja. The sudden death of the colonel born tyrant cast a dark shadow on the political future of the country but sparked widespread jubilation across the country. He was buried on the same day according to Islamic practices without a formal autopsy. This condor has resulted in several hypotheses as to what may have caused General Sani Abacha's death. While some claim he was killed by poisoned apple while in company of sex workers, others believe he was assassinated or poisoned by his political opponents. In this edition of Hispul Media, we revisit the last 24 hours of General Sani Abacha, Nigeria's military detector who ruled from 1993 to 1998. Please come with me, Gabriel here. On the 5th of June 1998, Three days before his sudden demise, General Sani Abacha had received information that the leader of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, Yasser Arafat, would be making a brief stopover at the Inamdi Azikiwe International Airport, Abuja, en route to Morocco. The Palestinian leader was scheduled to arrive at the airport on the 7th of June 1998 and have a brief meeting with the head of state. And the D-Day was Sunday, June 7, 1998 about 24 hours before his death. It was therefore a big event for Nigeria in view of the country's neutrality in the Middle East conflict in which Mr. Arafat was a key figure. In the mid-morning hours of Sunday 7 June 1998, the Palestinian leader arrived. He was accompanied by a very modest delegation and the Nigerian head of state was already waiting for him. He was as fit as a fiddle. After the usual pleasantries at the airport, General Sani Abacha and President Arafat immediately went into a private discussion at the VIP lounge of the presidential wing of the airport. Meanwhile, shortly after the head of state shook hands with one of the security guards that accompanied the Palestinian leader, the chief security officer CSO to the head of state, Major Hamza Al Mustafa noticed a sudden change of countenance of his boss. But he immediately informed the aide de camp, Lieutenant Colonel Abdullah, who advised that he keep a close watch on the president. But I'll come back to that in a moment. The press men outside waited curiously for the possible outcome of the talks between the two leaders, a sort of joint press conference on all issues involving the Nigerian-Palestine relation was expected. After the meeting, which was very brief, there was no press conference, rather. Yasser Arafat inspected a guard of honor mounted by a detachment of the Three Guards Brigade of the Nigerian Army and departed for Morocco. The whole ceremony at the airport lasted only about two hours. Now, before we continue, remember to leave a like on this video and subscribe to Hispul Media. You can equally support our effort on this channel by buying us a super thanks or by becoming a channel member in exchange for exclusive perks. Thank you. After meeting with the Palestinian leader, the head of state was expected to travel to Ouagadougou in Burkina Faso on Monday, June 8th to attend the OAU summit which was already at a ministerial session. The advance team of the head of state's entourage has already left on Friday night. But before leaving for Ouagadougou, the head of state was expected to declare open an international information conference expected to begin in Abuja on the same Monday, June 8th. The conference was organized by the Federal Ministry of Information. Meanwhile, back at the airport as the Palestinian leader departed, the head of state makes his way back to the villa. While in his car going back to the villa, the commander-in-chief was sleeping all along. This was unusual for the further indication that all was not well with the commander-in-chief. The chief security officer to the president had this to say about the president's health as he got back to the villa. He said, quote, Later in the evening of June 7, 1998, around 6 p.m., his doctor came around and administered an injection to stabilize him. He was advised to have a short rest. Happily enough, by 9 p.m., he was bouncing and receiving visitors until much later when General Jeremiah Husseini, the then Minister of the Federal Capital Territory, came to see him. Husseini was one of the head of state. They were very close friends. They stayed and chatted together till about 3.35 a.m. Jerry Huseni was the second most senior officer 
after the commander-in-chief. The CSO continued, A friend of the house was with me in my office and as he was bidding me farewell, he came back to inform me that the FCT minister, Jeremiah Useni, was out of the head of state's gates house within the villa. I then decided to inform the ADC and other security guards that I would be on my way home to prepare for the early morning events at the International Conference Center. At about 5 a.m., the security guards ran to my quarters to inform me that Abacha was very unstable. At first, I thought it was a coup attempt. Immediately, I prepared myself fully for any eventuality. As an intelligence officer and the chief security officer to the head of state, Al Mustafa devised some means of diverting the attention of the security boys from his escape route. He did tell his wife to continue chatting with the boys at the door. His wife was in the house while the boys were outside. The CSO used the exit outlet to leave the house and went straight to the guest house of the head of state. Al Mustafa said, When I got to the bedside of the head of state, he was already gasping. Ordinarily, I could not just touch him. It was not allowed in our job. But under this situation, I knelt close to him and shouted, General Sani Abacha, sir, please grant me permission to touch and carry you. But there was no response. I again knocked at the stool beside the bed and shouted in the same manner, yet he did not respond. I then realized there was a danger. I immediately called the head of state's personal physician, Dr. Sadiq Suleiman Wali, who arrived in the place within eight minutes from his house. He immediately gave Abacha two doses of injection, one at the heart and another close to his neck. This did not work, apparently as the head of state had turned very cold. He then told me that the head of state was dead and that nothing could be done after all. So, I asked the personal physician to remain with the dead body while I dash home to be fully prepared for the problems that might arise from the incidents. When he returned from his house that morning, he called key members of the Provisional Ruling Council including strategic military commanders for an emergency meeting with the commander-in-chief. He refused to disclose to them that Abacha was dead. At about 11 a.m., members of the PRC had begun to arrive at Asorok for an emergency meeting. Most of the members were informed only on arrival except the very powerful ones. That day, Major Hamza Al Mustafa looked very sharp and smartly dressed in his army tracksuit and white canvas. The Major was simply too busy, running from pillar to post, looking confident but certainly confused about the future without his boss. He was finally in charge, giving out orders to the rank and file to get the ASO Council chambers ready for the meeting. For Major Hamza Al Mustafa, the situation was bleak and he looked pitiable as he presided over the wreckage of a collapsed regime. Elsewhere in the villa, a gloomy atmosphere mingled with subdued excitement and relief pervaded. Two crucial meetings were in progress at the same time. One was a meeting of principal officers in the presidency and the venue was also rock wing of the chief of general staff. The other meeting of members of the provisional ruling council PRC was shifted to Akinola Aguda House. The two meetings later made for a crucial joint section at Aso Council Chambers. The joint section began at about 2 p.m. and ended at about 4.45 p.m. I believe the agenda of this crucial meeting was to appoint the successor to the head of state. While the joint meeting was in progress, Major Hamza Al Mustafa sat in the chair at the entrance holding a newspaper in his hands. He occasionally glanced at the newspaper. At this time, he looked rather relaxed after ensuring that every necessary arrangement had been put in place. His fear initially was that the vacuum was dangerous before General Sani Abacha's burial the same day. According to Major Hamza Al Mustafa, the situation became charged when one of the service chiefs, Lieutenant General Ishaya Rizi Bamiyi, suggested that he should be made the new head of state after he was quietly informed of Abacha's death. He even suggested that we should allow him access to Chief MKO Abiola. This suggestion prompted Major Amza Al Mustafa to take some strategic decisions that were of national significance. 
One of such decisions was to move Abiola to a safer place. Another important decision was the immediate evacuation of the condemned coup plotters in George's prison to a more secure place. The measure was probably to preempt any intention to summarily execute the plotters by possible overzealous forces. In another twist, when some junior officers overheard the suggestion of Bami, they suggested to Al Mustafa that all the members of the PRC should be killed and the public should be given the excuse that during the meeting of the PRC, a shootout occurred between members of the PRC and the bodyguards of the head of state. But Mustafa was aware that this would have created a far more delicate situation than the one on ground already. He talked to General Buba Marwa and General Ibrahim Sabo, both promptly advised against any bloodshed. They were advised to contact General Ibrahim Babangida, who equally advised against any bloodshed. Babangida also advised that the most senior officer in the Provisional Ruling Council, PRC, should be supported to become the head of state. They then agreed to support General Jeremiah Hosseini. But Bami queried, Can't you put two and two together to be four? Has it not occurred to you that Hosseini, who was the last man with the head of state, might have poisoned him? knowing very well that he was the most senior officer in the PRC. This may have shifted the balance of the equation against Jeremiah Hosseini as a successor to Abacha. From morning until about 5 pm on June 8, no official press statement on the death of General Sani Abacha from any quarters was issued, even when the incident was already known all over the world. This official statement was finally released at about 5.25 pm. Meanwhile, the meeting at the ASO Council Chambers, which was to answer the question who succeeds Abacha, was drawing to a close. Shortly after the meeting had ended, General Abdusalami Abubakar walked out of the meeting ahead of other senior military officers. This immediately conveyed the message that he had been chosen as a new head of state. He immediately took charge of overseeing the arrangement to convey the body of the commander in chief for burial in Kanu and the head of state was buried in Kano on the same day. Meanwhile, rumors began to spread across the world on the likely cause of the president's sudden death. Shortly after his death, rumors soon circulate that the head of state has been given apple juice spikes with poison by female sex workers, notably from India. The New York Times, for example, advanced this rumor when it reported on July 11, 1998 that the Nigerian head of state may have been poisoned while in the company of three prostitutes. But this rumor is said to be unfounded because Dr. Suleiman Wali collaborated Al Mustafa's testimony in an interview with the BBC. While there was no autopsy to determine the cause of the president's death, the official statement claimed that the general died of heart attack. Lieutenant General Abdusalami Abubakar was sworn in in a ceremony on June 9, 1998 at about 1.40 p.m., officially ending the era of General Sani Abacha. For more on how Abiola got into trouble with General Sani Abacha's dictatorship regime, please click this video here. Don't forget to leave a like on this video and subscribe to Hispul Media for more interesting African history stories. And I will see you in the next one. Thank you very much for watching. Gabriel here.